All right, thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. We really appreciate it. We are going to give folks just a couple of minutes to join if they haven't done so already. So thank you for being here and we will get started momentarily. Again, thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. We really appreciate you all being here and taking the time. Um, we are going to give folks just a couple of minutes to join if they haven't done so already. So um, thank you for your patience and we will get started in just a couple of minutes. All right, it is two after, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining this afternoon. We really appreciate you being here and taking the time. My name is Becky Timmons. I'm the communications coordinator here at Common Cause, and I will be leading us through this briefing. Um, so welcome to the fourth of eight Common Cause weekly media briefings in the lead up to election day. Early voting has started in many states and we're seeing record numbers of vote by mail or absentee ballot requested and returned um, more than 4 million ballots already counted by reporting states. So today we're going to hear from some of our state directors about what's happening on the ground to protect the right to vote. Um, we have many speakers today, so we are going to hear from all of them and then we will take time to uh, ask questions and get those answered. Um, we will make this recording available to you afterward once the recording is ready. So. Um, you will have that once it is done. So uh, to kick us off, I'm going to throw it over to my colleague Elena Nunez, the Director of State Operations and Ballot Initiatives and a representative of Common Cause Colorado. Elena. Hi, good afternoon and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I want to highlight something that Becky just said, which is that now that we're less than a month away from Election Day, our election is well underway. And we need to make sure that voters understand that we now have an election season, not just an election day. And over the course of the coming week, we're gonna see even more states begin to mail ballots to voters and open up early voting sites. And even in the last day, we've seen another million ballots get processed. And according to the US Elections Project, more than 5.5 million voters have cast ballots so far. So that number is steadily climbing and I highlight that because compared to 2016, we are seeing a three or four fold increase over the same number of returns in that election period. And I think there's a few reasons for that that I just want to highlight. The first is that we're seeing a lot more turnout, an earlier turnout due to increased use of vote by mail. In 2016, there were only three states that mailed ballots to every registered voter. That was California, or sorry, excuse me, Colorado, Washington, and Oregon. This year, there'll be another seven states plus the District of Columbia that will be mailing to all or most of the counties within their state. We're also seeing in states that are not mailing ballots to every voter that voters are choosing to request absentee ballots and they're also turning out early to participate in early vote. So we know that there is a lot of enthusiasm around this election and that that is showing itself in early turnout. The other thing, though, that I think is important to highlight, though, is that there are a lot of voters in a lot of states that are running expanded vote by mail programs in a way that they never have before. And that means that it's important for our states, and you'll be hearing from several of them, to make sure that voters understand the rules of requesting mail ballots if they need to, and also what their options are for returning those ballots. And I think this is a key part of voter education 
making sure that voters understand that in some states you can mail a ballot through election day and have that ballot be counted. In other states, you have to have it uh, received by election day. In some states, you can return a ballot at any polling place or drop box within your community. In some states, you have to go only to designated locations. These rules vary by state and in some states are continuing to change due to ongoing litigation. So making sure that voters know the rules for their community, even as they are changing, is going to be a priority and incredibly important to make sure that voters have their votes counted. The other piece that I think is really important is making sure that for voters who don't, aren't familiar with vote by mail, understand the rules of what they need to do to make sure their vote is counted. And some states have pretty significant cure programs, which are programs to help voters make sure if there's a question about their ballot that they're able to deal with that. In other states, it's much more limited. So again, a key part of our voter education will be making sure that voters understand what they need to do. And I just wanna to highlight today, the Secretary of State in Colorado just put out an announcement that Colorado will be implementing a program that will allow voters to cure their ballots by text message. So if a voter has a question about their ballots uh, eligibility, they'll be able to text a code, take a picture of the affidavit and text it back so that their ballot will be counted. That's an important innovation to make sure that voters don't get left behind, but we need to make sure that wherever the rules are, that voters understand what that is. And then finally, I think the other piece which has started to get attention, but I think needs to be said over and over again, we need to make sure that voters understand that processing mail ballots take time. And some states are already beginning to process those ballots. And we know based on returns uh, in terms of numbers, what that looks like. Other states won't start even the beginning processing or counting until election day or the day before. And for those states, it means that there will be a longer time before we know the results. And I wanna highlight two things. One, even in states that begin to process mail ballots, that does not mean that they're re releasing results. So we don't know who voters are voting for in any of the states that start earlier processing. And so that's not a concern and that's not something voters should think is happening. But for states that do wait, it also means it takes time. And then the time to do the resolution around questions about signatures or witnesses or other eligibility, that means it takes longer to get results. So we need to make sure that voters understand that the most important thing is to count every ballot and get a full count, not a quick count. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to some of my colleagues to talk more about what's happening in their states. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Next, I'm going to pass it to Bob Phillips, the Executive Director of Kamikaze in North Carolina. Bob? Yes, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me and good afternoon. Um, voting has begun in North Carolina. We were actually the first state in America where absentee ballots were sent out beginning September 4th. And in 2016, I believe we were as a state 3.6% uh, vote by mail, maybe the least uh, participatory rate in the country. So we do not have a tradition here in North Carolina to vote by mail, but uh, as we are seeing uh, a 20 fold almost increase in uh, the request for uh, absentee ballots, we are not a state that automatically sends uh, a request to voters. They have to actually do that themselves, but uh, they can do it electronically, which they never could before. And uh, at least uh, from my understanding right now, about 5% of our electorate have already voted uh, by mail. In North Carolina, we do have a robust early voting period. It will begin October 15th. Uh, it is a traditional 17 day, October 15th through October 31st. And ever since 2008, we've actually seen more North Carolina voters utilize early voting than election day. And even with the pandemic, uh, we do feel that uh, there will be many, many people in our state who will utilize the early voting. Uh, we do have weekend hours as well. This is throughout all 100 counties. Uh, people who do decide to vote absentee, they can turn that absentee ballot uh, at one of those early voting sites during the early voting period. If they have some questions or you know doubts about the reliability of the mail, they can also uh, return their um, absentee ballot to the County Board of Elections uh, offices during normal business hours. 
Um, election day, our State Board of Elections, we have a State Board of Elections that handles our elections here in North Carolina and not the Secretary of State. And uh, they're predicting that maybe when we wake up November 3rd, 80 percent uh, of our votes will already be in. Uh, as Elena pointed out, we are one of those states where it began last Tuesday, September 29th, uh, every absentee ballot that had been received and had been accepted, and that is, uh, it was filled out properly. We require one witness signature along with the voter signing the ballot as well. But uh, all those absentee ballots were opened up, flattened out, and then run through a tabulator. And these are public meetings and they occur every Tuesday. In fact, today it's happening again in every county across North Carolina. And that gives us a head start where we will not be having to uh, uh, come election night, uh, then start that process. Uh, as Elena mentioned, we are not counting and releasing information uh, of who's ahead. Uh, it's just simply that these ballots are run through a tabulator. And again, uh, on election night, uh, the actual tallies can be um, uh, quickly revealed as we're counting the ballots. Um, I have a colleague, and I'm going to turn it over to him, uh, Izzy Hernandez-Cruz, and Izzy is one who crunches uh, the numbers. Uh, overwhelmingly, most people are getting it right, but Izzy, you may have a little more to say about kind of what we're seeing with uh, folks in North Carolina uh, voting by mail. So Izzy, I'm going to uh, pass the baton to you. Sure, and thank you, Bob. So already we've seen more than 1,200,000 requests for absentee ballots in North Carolina. That's about 17% of the total electorate. So a, lar a, a large share of the voters have, like Bob said, gone out and requested ballots. Um, already we've seen almost one third of those ballots that have been requested already returned. So already people are going ahead and, put, and submitting their ballot to be counted. As they've been processed, we've begun to watch the deficiencies that the state reports uh, publicly. We've noticed the witness requirement has caused some problems. Um, a lot of voters are having that deficiency reporter reported, but also uh, we've seen an increase in returned undeliverable deficiencies reported out. Also, we've noticed that almost 7,000 return ballots have been marked as pending or pending cure. So we want to keep an eye and make sure that these ballots are eventually processed and accepted so that each voter can have their ballot count. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to Becky to introduce the next person. Awesome. Thank you so much, Izzy and Bob, for that update. Next, we have up Jay Heck, Executive Director of Common Cause in Wisconsin. Hang on, Jay, you're on mute. Hang on, Jay, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, is that better? I'm sorry. There you go. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon from Madison. Uh, the continuing legal drama in Wisconsin continues uh, with regard to the acceptance of absentee ballots. You will recall that Wisconsin was the only state last April that did not postpone its, uh, its spring primary. And one of the issues then uh, that was not resolved until the day before the primary election by the United States Supreme Court was the issue of acceptance of absentee ballots uh, that had been mailed in but not received by election clerks uh, on election, by election day. Um, and what the federal court and the Supreme Court ultimately ruled is that absentee ballots that were postmarked by the election, April 7th in the primary, November 3rd uh, in the case of the general, uh, could be accepted and counted for up to six days uh, after the election. A federal judge uh, several weeks ago in the Western District Court of Wisconsin ordered that that same provision that had been permitted in the uh, spring primary ought to be permitted in the November election. So therefore that any absentee ballot that was postmarked by November 3rd could be accepted uh, by clerks uh, for the six days following and that the, uh, the final results in Wisconsin would not be known until uh, November 9th. 
that decision, even though it had been endorsed essentially by the United States Supreme Court and by the Federal District Court uh, Court of Appeals in Chicago for the Seventh Circuit back in April, uh, was immediately appealed by the Republican Party of Wisconsin and the Republican leadership, legislative leadership in Wisconsin. Uh, they didn't think that this uh, election merited the acceptance of, accept of absentee ballots at the election day, um, uh, November 3rd. And a three-judge panel, all Republican appointments in the Seventh uh, Circuit, ruled uh, last week that the Republican Party and the Republican leadership did not have proper standing. They could not demonstrate harm by the fact that absentee ballots would be accepted after that, and therefore said that their lawsuit could not be pursued. Well, the Republicans then decided that the federal three-judge panel had it wrong, and they went to their state Supreme Court to get an interpretation of what, it, what in fact the Republicans and the leadership could do in a case like this. And the state Supreme Court yesterday on a 4-3 conservatives voting yes, uh, progressives on the Supreme Court voting no, said that yes, the Republican leadership did have the ability to appeal it to the uh, federal district uh, uh, court of appeals in Chicago. And so the Republicans are now asking the full 11 judge panel on the seventh circuit uh, court of appeals to hear their case. And of course, as you all know, one of the people sitting on that seventh circuit is judge Amy Coney Barrett. So it will be interesting to see whether or not this actually does get before the full Seventh Circuit and whether Judge Barrett will be one of the people who will hear this if in fact the full Seventh Circuit uh, decides to hear the, the, the case. Now the full Seventh Circuit could decide still to reject the Republican Party and the Republican leadership appeal. That's something that we don't know, uh, but this decision by the Wisconsin Supreme Court yesterday to essentially intervene and make their views known uh, is something that sort of complicates the whole, uh, the whole process. And just uh, to reiterate what North Carolina has said, early voting is well underway here in Wisconsin. We expect uh, that upwards of 50 to 60% of the people who vote in uh, this November election will have done so by absentee uh, uh, ballot or um, uh, through the mail absentee ballot. Uh, and that process began at the end of September uh, and is continuing unabated with really heavy uh, absentee ballot returns. I'll just end with this final thing. It's, it's a slightly lighter note, uh, but that is that yesterday, the Wisconsin Elections Commission, which like in North Carolina oversees elections, we do not have a Secretary of State that oversees elections. The Elections Commission yesterday decided not to utilize both the Fiserv Arena, where the Milwaukee Bucks play basketball, or Miller Park, where the Milwaukee Brewers play baseball, as places where people can go to vote in person early for the period before the election. Uh, it's something that both the Milwaukee Bucks and the Milwaukee Brewers very much wanted to do in public spirit, but the Republican Party of Wisconsin complained that utilizing uh, Bango, the Milwaukee Bucks logo, or the racing sausages at, at Miller Park, uh, who uh, race around between innings, would somehow be politicizing uh, our sports in Wisconsin and complain bitterly that neither Fiserv Arena nor uh, Miller Park ought to be utilized. The Wisconsin Elections Commission decided not to do that, but not because of the complaints by the Republicans. It was really more so because they failed to notify uh, the proper people in Milwaukee that those were two places that could be used for early voting. So it was on a technicality. And I might add that both the Milwaukee Bucks and the Milwaukee Brewers added that they very much look forward to utilizing their facilities for uh, voting in the future because they don't view either the racing sausages or a bango, the buck, as partisan, but more as people who are encouraging participation in democracy. Thank you.
Thank you, Jay. Um, next up, we have Liza McClenahan, board chair of Common Cause in Florida, who has had not a busy 24 hours at all. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about rapid response by text messaging from our Common Cause action team. So on Monday, October the 5th was book closing here in Florida. In the middle of the afternoon, we started to hear on our election protection hotline 866-R-VOTE that individual voters were having trouble completing the voter registration process online. And we also were hearing from our partner organizations that were trying to process a large number of voters and promoting the hotline, which was open until midnight whereas the supervisor of elections in-person voting opportunities would close at either extended hours or their normal business hours on Monday. Our partner All Voting is Local has been working on the security and capacity issues of our online voter registration system for years and has gotten very little response from the administration. Our coalition of voting rights organizations sent several letters to the Secretary of the State and the Governor about a number of issues, which included asking for a third party stress test of the online voter registration system since we had documented problems in 2018 and again in the primary as we approached book closing. Our coalition called for an extension of the voter registration deadline once we heard about the problems and issues. The state says they're working with federal authorities to identify exactly what the problem is. But yesterday, a little afternoon, the Secretary of State did extend the deadline to seven o'clock yesterday for early voting, um, excuse me, for uh, book closing. We tasked our Common Cause Action Team to text bank into Florida with his extension information and a link to register to vote florida.org, which is the state's voter registration site. So we had 195 volunteers and we got uh, a couple of responses about 417 who responded yes, they were registered to vote, 107 who said no, they weren't. But for the rest of the folks who did not respond, they went through and clicked about 1,214 portal clicks, and we're still counting those. We have about 1,500 trained volunteers in our action team who are working within any state um, in the country. And we focus on issues that require a rapid response or just continuing voter education about the issues that you've already heard from our other states reporting on how to vote by mail, when early voting is available, and other issues around voting. And just to keep track with our friends, in Florida, 5.5 million vote by mail ballots have been requested. And as of this morning, 947,683 have been returned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liza. And last but certainly not least, we have Anthony Gutierrez, who is the Executive Director of Common Cause in Texas. Anthony. Yeah, thank you, Becky. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Elena mentioned at the top of the call, there were some states where lots of things are still up in the air, and um, that's where we're at in Texas right now. Um, I can give you an update on four uh, pieces of litigation three things that just happened this morning and then our own litigation that we filed a couple days ago. Um, first in, uh, in Bear County, which is in San Antonio, um, a pair of advocacy groups this morning filed seeking to uh, force the county to increase the number of poll sites. Um, I just saw this one, but I saw these numbers off the top of my head, but um, Bear County is approximately the same size as Dallas County. And the last time we checked, Dallas had significantly more poll sites. Um, so Bear County probably um, um, does need to increase and there are some, uh, there will be some um, litigation seeking to do that at some point here. Um, we also had two decisions from the Texas Supreme Court about an hour ago. Um, the first of those had to do with in Harris County, the clerk was trying to mail out vote by mail applications to every registered voter um, in the county and just letting them sort of decide for themselves whether they believed that they qualified under the state's fairly narrow interpretation of who's allowed to vote by mail. 
Um, this, in a unanimous decision, the state Supreme Court said they would not be allowed to do that. Um, and then the second thing they decided today was the, um, there was a group of six Republicans, several very prominent um, Republican officials included, um, among them our agriculture commissioner and the chair of the state uh, Republican party, who were seeking to reverse Governor Abbott's order that was extending early vote an additional week. He was, he, his order basically gave six additional days of early voting. Um, the, this group of Republicans felt that that exceeded his authority and they were seeking to strike that down. Uh, the Supreme Court said that um, the order would stand. So as of today, early voting is starting next week um, as planned. And it's really important to note that the, the basis for the decision, what they said was basically like this, this decision, this order came down in July. Um, Y'all waited way too long. We are way too close to the election. People are already sending in mail ballots, like early voting starts in a week. It's way, way too late for this. We are not going to do this. So along those lines, that brings us to our litigation, which is seeking to challenge the governor's um, uh, more recent order, which is limiting ballot uh, drop-off sites for mail ballots in Texas to one per county. Um, our litigation was filed two days ago with um, the Anti-Defamation League, um, an individual plaintiff and, and represented by the, the Brennan Center. Um, basically our contention here is, is two things. Um, first, this, that this exceeds the governor's authority because um, under Texas statute, early voting is the purview of um, local election officials. And then the second piece is that this basically just makes it really unreasonably difficult for eligible Texans to use um, vote by mail. Um, and I can sort of unpack that a little in, in Texas, you know, there are, a, there are a handful of counties that were planning to use multiple Dropbox sites and it can sound like, well, it's just a couple of counties. But when you think about a place like Harris County, um, if it were a state, it would be larger than a lot of states. Like it's roughly the same population size as New Mexico, like geographically the size of like Connecticut. Like it is a massive, massive landmass and a huge population. Um, you also have to think about Texas is one of the only states, one of only five, I think at last count, that didn't take any action whatsoever to expand vote by mail to a wider audience than uh, people who are over 65 or disabled or out of their home county. Um, so the people that are eligible in Texas, like they're disabled or they're over 65. They're people who are probably going to lack transportation to be able to get to, you know, this one site in Harris County that's, you know, probably downtown. Um, uh, so, you know, asking them like public transportation or to go to this one place in the county where you're now going to make it much more crowded because everybody has to go to the same place. Like these are just not the things you want to do with, um, you know, these people who are also the, the, the demographics that are most at risk of being significantly harmed by, uh, by COVID. So um, that is, um, those are sort of the, those are at least the top of the things that we are looking at right now in Texas um, and happy to expand on any of those if anybody has questions. Thanks, Anthony. All right, we're gonna open it up for questions now. There's a couple of ways in which you can ask questions. You can throw them in either the chat or the Q&A function that you see at the bottom of your screens. Or if you would like, you can raise your hand and I will call on you. I just ask that you identify uh, your organization and um, say your name, please. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them. So um, I know that reporter, a couple of reporters have asked this when uh, registering, so I will uh, kick this off here. But with all of this um, sort of litigation that is in the appeals process or uh, is ongoing, how does this affect voters that are already voting that's underway? What do voters need to know now? Um, I guess this is for Anthony and, and Jay. Um, how is this affecting voters in your state and um, what would you like your voters to know? Uh, this is Jay Heck in Wisconsin. Um, what I will say is that uh, <laughs> the, the pending decision by, uh, by the federal judge with regard to the return of absentee ballots really doesn't change what we've been urging voters to do, which is to uh, vote early, to get their absentee ballots as soon as possible 
and really get them in. Uh, we, 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 we've even suggested an arbitrary deadline of Halloween uh, by getting it in, mailing it, uh, uh, dropping it off at one of the drop boxes that are available in many counties. Uh, because even, <laughs> even if this is extended beyond uh, election day with regard to the counting, it would still have to be postmarked by November 3rd. So that just leaves a real tight uh, deadline and timeline for people to get their absentee ballots in. So again, I think, and this is true in every state, it's better to do this early rather than wait to the last minute. Yeah, and, and in Texas, it, um, you know, largely we're still trying to educate people in the same way, trying to make sure, trying to encourage them to vote early. Um, but, you know, what all these things really do is just contribute to voter confusion, which is, is, is always, over the past at least three election cycles, been a huge issue in Texas. Um, the state just does little to nothing to communicate about voting procedures and just let people know, like, here's the type of identification you need and here are the procedures for, you know, everything from curbside voting to, like, vote by mail. Um, having all of these things sort of changing at the last minute, like it, it is really hard for me to keep up with as someone who does this for a living. You know, if you are an average Texan who's just sort of catching headlines, um, it, it's confusing. It's, it, is, it is tough. You know, functionally, the processes are sort of similar, but, you know, the, the places where they could have dropped off their ballots are different, you know, today than they were a week and a half ago. So it's, um, it is tough, but there is a a very large coalition of um, advocacy groups and uh, county officials, I would add, who are just really trying hard to sort of fill that information vacuum and make sure uh, Texans are getting the information they need. Awesome, thank you. Um, I see we have a question from Bill Whitaker. Bill, go ahead. Yes, um, uh, this is regards uh, to the Texas situation. So I'll shoot this to Anthony. My question is, is, is there any discussion amidst all the confusion that is now going on in Texas uh, on the eve of early voting? Is there any talk about uh, doing something legislatively uh, in the January session of the Texas legislature to perhaps reform or revamp uh, some of our election laws to eliminate all this chaos? That's the question, and I'll uh, shut up from now on. Thank you. Uh, so, so the short answer is no. Um, among the like the the people who are current members of the legislature, um, you know, it, it it is Texas. Over the past, uh, I would say, you know, fifteen years, any kind of reforms that would really sort of improve access or safety, for that matter, um, when it comes to voting, uh, go almost nowhere. And you really just see legislation moving when it are when it's things that would create additional systemic obstacles. Um, you know, that said, we. We are definitely talking to a lot of legislators um, you know, now and have been over the course of the past, um, I don't know, six months about reforms that um, should be implemented, you know, that, that could be implemented by the governor, things like vote by mail expansion that should have happened now, but also things that um, certainly we would like to see carried as a bill in the next legislative session. Um, there are a ton of people who are willing to carry those bills who want to do things like making the early vote extension permanent, um, expanding access to vote by mail, um, procedures related to like masks, the polls, which are, um, which we do not really have right now in the way that we, we want them. Um, we definitely have a lot of people who are interested in carrying those bills and pushing them forward, but um, you know, the, the people who um, are on board with those are not the, the Republicans who currently are in control of um, you know, every house and every statewide office, every um, chamber of the Texas legislature and every statewide office. Um, so that's, that is where we're at as, as of today. Thanks, Anthony. Um, this is for all state leads on the call, but given the huge absentee numbers when do you expect to see election results in your states? And I'll let you guys decide who wants to go first. <laughs> I, I can tell you in Texas, we are, we, um, our, 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 last legislate, our last legislative session, they passed a bill that's going to allow some large counties to start processing ballots um, earlier. And I forget exactly what the start date can now be, but it's slightly before when they could previously do it. Um, that said, I think we are definitely in the category, again, that Elena mentioned at the top of the call, where 
a lot of our place, a lot of our large counties specifically are, are not going to have election night results. And um, we are really trying to tell people that that's, that's fine. It's, it's more important that we get it right than we get it quickly. Hi, this is Liza McClanahan in Florida. The dates I'm going to give you are the normal dates for processing ballots in Florida. So election night, we call it preliminary returns, not results. And on Friday are the first unofficial results. And that would include people who had to cure their ballots, their vote by mail ballots or their provisional ballots by five o'clock on Thursday, the day before. We also have to wait 10 days for the overseas ballots to come in, which would take you to November 13th. And so our certification date for the official results in Florida is Sunday, November 15th from the counties, and then the state certifies the results two days later on the 17th at 9 a.m. Uh, in Go Wisconsin, ahead, I can tell you, in Wisconsin, um, if this federal decision, federal judge's decision to extend the absentee ballot process for six days stands, uh, obviously we would not have uh, full results known in Wisconsin until November 9th. Uh, but the difference between uh, this time and last April was that the, the, the judge's uh, order said that in Wisconsin results could be released each day that county clerks get uh, absentee ballots received after November 3rd. So there'd be a, a count in each of the days leading up till November 9th. But the final count uh, would not be known until uh, uh, eight o'clock, uh, November 9th. I'll, I'll go ahead in North Carolina, like I mentioned, uh, and it was really due to uh, bipartisan legislation that was passed in June that we were a part of where we began processing and tabulating our absentee ballots five weeks before election day. It started last Tuesday. Again, continues today. So we feel like we're in pretty good shape, hard to believe, I guess, when you think about North Carolina and what all happens here. But that uh, come election day, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we may have by and large most of our ballots counted. We do have a little bit of litigation that I didn't mention, but it's really revolving around uh, some issues with um, resolving, i.e. curing a ballot regarding the witness signature and extending the time that a ballot would be counted, provided it's properly postmarked on uh, November 3rd. Right now, that ballot can be counted up to November 6th, the Friday after the election. Um, there is some litigation going where we might be able to extend it to November 12th, but that's not going to impact uh, voting, nor will it impact uh, the count. Uh, we, we have some hotly contested races here in our state, so some of those provisionals and absentee ballots uh, that come in might be the deciders, but overall, uh, we're in pretty good shape. Yeah, and I'll just say for Colorado, Colorado has a returned by deadline, which means all ballots have to be in by uh, close of polls on election day, which is 7 p.m. But as Liza said, and I think this is true overwhelmingly, there is that is just preliminary results based on what's been processed as they get released. Colorado has an eight day window for overseas voters to return their ballots as well as for issues to be resolved via cure. So if a voter returns their ballot and there's a question about their signature or something like that, there are eight days when that can be resolved. So although we will have preliminary results pretty quickly, um, there is an eight day window. So we need to make sure we're clear that final results take more time because there are processes that have to be uh, undertaken to count all of the votes that are eligible. And that's a good thing. Thank you. Um, I see that we have a question from Grace. Grace, go ahead. Hi everyone, this is Grace Panetta from Business Insider. Thank you as always for doing this. Um, I'm wondering sort of what, is, what are the broader impacts and implications of the record amount of election litigation we're seeing? Um, both obviously we were talking earlier this year about the possible um, of, of voter confusion, but also sort of in the long term, uh, what does this all mean and what are some of the implications here? 
whoever wants to answer can. I'm happy to start and then if other folks want to jump in. I mean, I think in the short term, as you said, the, the real impact is on voter confusion. And that is why we and many of our partners are working really hard to make sure that as the laws or the policies change, we're making sure voters understand what they need to do to make a plan to vote and have that vote counted. I think in the long term, though, of this litigation and these rapid changes because of the pandemic are really highlighting places where our election laws don't serve voters and where there's a need to have more comprehensive reforms. And so I think in many of our states, we'll be taking the lessons learned from this election cycle to go back and in upcoming legislative sessions say, how can we change the laws in our states to make sure that there is clarity and that there's access because States have done, I think, in many cases, a remarkable job of trying to create expanded access during a pandemic, but the laws haven't always kept up. And I think now, post-election, we're going to need to look back and say, what do we need to do so that in the future, voters have options and we can run elections with more clarity so that voters aren't confused and we aren't trying to put new systems together patchwork. I don't know if any of the other states want to chime in about what that might look like for them. Yeah, I can I can um, sort of give a more sort of the the, the Texas view on that. Um, it, it's definitely I think just along the same lines of what Elena said. Like short term, like it you know it, it is confusion. Confusion is the big issue in Texas. We had in 2014 and 2016 um, voter ID litigation that the, the Hobby School of Public Affairs out of Houston studied and found a really significant number of people who just like, they were really confused about identification requirements and just their, their what they decided to do was just not go vote because they were confused about what, what am I allowed to use? What can't I use? Like, how can I get in trouble? Like they, they had the identification that was needed um, and they just, were confused. And that was one voter ID case. Do you think about the, the number of cases right now that are pending and still being decided? Like I can only imagine what that confusion is going to be like. But long term, you know, it, it is really difficult in Texas to pass legislation, um, except in some cases where you have specific people or problems that you can point to and say, look at this thing. And here is the reform that will solve this thing. Um, in, in, in this upcoming election, if we have the same type of massive lines like we saw in the primary, which if you all remember in Texas, we, we had our primaries in March, which was like pre-pandemic. And we had like eight and a half hour lines in some parts of the state. I mean, being able to point to issues like that if they happen again in the general election and provide like a, hey, here are the things we can do so that this is not an issue and have people who are actually impacted show up and testify, assuming that's a thing that we're allowed to do in this next legislative session, which who knows? Uh, but, you know, it, it, it sets up in a way that we might actually be able to get some reforms impacted. It, it may just be, you know, enough just kind of trouble and visibility and voices of actual Texans clamoring for it that, um, you know, it's just uh, impossible to say no to some of these reforms. Any other states have anything to add? Yeah, this is uh, Jay Heck in Wisconsin. I'll just say very shortly that uh, absentee voting by mail is, I think, here to stay. Uh, in Wisconsin, it had never been more than 5% of the, of the voting population. Uh, as I mentioned, it could be as high as 50, 60% this time. I don't think people are going to want to go back to the traditional way. So we're going to have to adjust our, our laws and our procedures and uh, the way we accept uh, ballots and all of the rest. Uh, just to just to be able to accommodate uh, elections in the future, I think. Uh, so I think that is a major, major change, uh, not only in Wisconsin, but probably across the country. Thank you. This is Liza in Florida. One of the things we learned coming out of the 2000 election in Florida is that there are 67 different ways to execute an election. So part of our work with our partners is to meet with the supervisors of elections on a regular basis and make inquiries about how they're implementing the election in their county. So for instance, they have different days and times for early voting to start. They have different um, 
time periods for other activities and whether or not they pay for postage of the return of vote by mail ballots. So we try to gather that information from them. Because they were sued earlier this year by a number of other groups, we weren't among them. They didn't want to answer our questions because they sounded like a deposition to them, that we were gathering more information in order to sue them further. So our relationships are slightly different and we hope that those will improve over time so that we can gather the information we need to pass it on to the voter and to answer their questions quickly on the election protection hotline. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions, uh, we'll, we'll end it here, but bottom line, we just really want to reiterate that despite efforts to suppress the vote, people should still be very confident that they can vote safely and securely in person and by mail. Um, we encourage all voters to make a plan and vote early if they can. And if any voters have or see problems, they are encouraged to call 866-R-VOTE where nonpartisan election protection volunteers are ready to help. So thank you to all of our speakers and to all of you for joining today. We appreciate you taking the time. Um, and that'll be it from us today. Thank you all very much.